Well, I will uh, start now. We seem to have people still joining, uh, but I want to say good morning to those of you who are in the US and to, uh, good afternoon to the rest of us who are um, in the other side of the country. The other side of the world. Um, I'm delighted to have so many people who have signed up to our webinar today, and I would like to thank uh, NGO CSW enormously for hosting us. My name is Alice Law, and I'm the CEO of Committed to Good or CTG as we're better known. CTG is a company that enables humanitarian and development projects in fragile and conflict affected countries. We started working in Afghanistan in 2006 and have since expanded across 25 different countries, predominantly those affected by conflict in Africa, the Middle East and Asia. We've supported the implementation of many humanitarian projects from improving the access to health facilities in Yemen, human rights monitoring and monitoring the movements of migrants in Libya and advising governments on their constitution in countries like Somalia, right through to the distribution of food in, in South Sudan. Personally, since the beginning, I've been a passionate advocate for the Sustainable Development Goals and in particular FI generality. And these have been integrated into the heart of CTG and our operations. I'm your moderator today. And I'm absolutely delighted that you've all been able to join us. Um, please introduce yourselves in the chat. So uh, now we have to use that as the main um, way of being able to answer and see your questions. So um, please try not to um, dis make people's questions disappear off the screen. So for the next hour and a half, we are going to be discussing, discussing the United Nations Women's Empowerment Principles and the importance of implementing these in fragile and conflict affected countries. We have some amazing and inspiring speakers who are joining us today on the panel um, who are going to cover the following topics. Um, the importance of women's full and effective participation and decision making in public life in developing countries, which is in line with uh, the CSW priority theme for this year and the role of education and the connection of these with women's economic empowerment, particularly in conflict settings like Afghanistan, Gaza and Somalia. We hope that this will inspire many of you to make the same public commitments we have and, and sign the UN Women's Empowerment Principles. Just on housekeeping, um, yeah, as I said, please ask your questions in the chat function. Um, and we are also live streaming this via social media and there will be a recording available um, after the event. And I would like to start by making a quick introduction to our panelists. So we have Stephanie Foster, um, who joined us bright and early this morning from the USA. Stephanie is a recognized voice in, in women's leadership and empowerment. She's the founding partner of Smash Strategies, which provides strategic advice to ensure investments in women and girls are effective and transformational. She served at both the US Department of State and for the US Embassy in Afghanistan. And in both the US and abroad, she's worked extensively on programs to increase core leadership, civic engagement, advocacy skills, particularly of women. We have our second speaker is Asha Abdeli Sayat, who joins us from Somalia today. I actually had the privilege of meeting Asha at our Committed to Good Summit in Somalia in Mogadishu in 2019. And Asha has spent many years in, in Canada and is an influential and inspirational member of the Somali diaspora community, diaspora community. She's the co-founder of the Somali Women's Leadership Initiative. Asha now serves as the executive director of the initiative. Her leadership, the Somali Women's Leadership Initiative, was, has mobilized women's participation in peace, in state formation and political processes, and strives to bring about changes to make politics more inclusive across Somalia. And also from Somalia, but joining us today from her home in the UK, um, we have Dr. Sadia Siat, 
Um, she's the founder of Hano Group and the Chancellor of Hano Academy. Hano is an academic progression and polytechnic academy in Mogadishu, Somalia. And Sadia is also the chair of the managing committee of the Somali STEM Society, which is an umbrella association for science, technology, engineering and mathematics in all of the Somali regions. Um, Nadia is also importantly a, a WEPS signatory. Finally, I introduce you to Isad Abu Malou, who joins us today from Gaza. Isad is the CEO of Oxford English Centre, a private sector educational platform that adopts an SDG-oriented business model to promote quality education, gender equality and economic growth for Palestinian youth in the Gaza Strip. Isad and I met at our first ever Committee to Good Science and we've since partnered together on a number of initiatives to empower women in Gaza. It was actually my first trip to Gaza in 2014 that really encouraged me to do more for gender equality. I was sat at a barbecue with my staff there and one of our team approached me and um, a lady called Salwa Nasser. And Salwa is a civil engineer and an important member of our team who monitor the use of construction materials. Salwa pointed out to me that I was in a unique position to support women like her who face the many complex challenges of being a woman and living in a war-torn country. And it was Salwa who really inspired us to launch our Female First initiative in 2017, which aligns with SDGs 5, 8 and 16. And Female First pledges to create job opportunities for women in conflict affected countries and has a goal of 30% of all of our project related roles being represented by women by 2030. Female First also champions CTG's projects and implementation of the WEPs in our workplace, marketplace and local communities within which we work. So thank you to all of our panellists enormously for taking the time to join us in our webinar today. Um, I will return to the speakers in just a moment, but um, I will now just do a quick overview as to what are the UN Women's Empowerment Principles, or the WEPs, as they are more commonly known. Um, some of you may already be familiar, I see the poll that uh, is showing quite a lot of people already know what they are, so I will keep it very quick. I like to think, uh, the WEPs are seven principles, I like to think of them as seven simple steps that businesses can take to promote gender equality and empower women in the workplace, marketplace and community. They were established by the UN Global Compact and UN Women and are informed by international labour and human rights standards and are grounded in the recognition that businesses have a responsibility for gender equality and women's empowerment. WEPS is also a primary vehicle for businesses to deliver on gender equality elements of the United Nations Agenda for Sustainable Development, specifically SDG 5. And it's probably important to note that the WEPs are actually designed for private sector organisations, but other organisations such as NGOs can act as allies to the initiative by also using the principles as a framework to guide their own gender equality ambitions. Um, so far, there are over 4,000 companies that have committed to the WEPs, um, but in fragile and, fragile and conflict affected countries, the number of signatories are very few and, and this is our mission today is to really change this and we hope many of you who have not actually signed up to the WEPs will be inspired to do so today. So I'm going to turn to our speakers now. Um, they're going to tell you a little bit about their organization and their experiences um, that have shaped their understanding of what empowerment means and why it's so important to women in, in fragile and conflict affected countries. Um, so I would like to turn to Stephanie first, please. And again, I would like you ask all to please send in your questions. I'll be keeping an eye on them now. Um, so Stephanie, um, I hope your coffee has kicked in and you're ready to tell everyone a little bit about yourself and SMASH strategies, perhaps sharing a bit about the important work you did towards gender equality and, and, and women's empowerment in Afghanistan. Uh, yes, well, thank you so much for asking me to join you. And yes, it's the morning here, but I've had two cups of coffee, so hopefully uh, I'm speaking in complete sentences. 
Um, but I am very happy to talk about SMASH strategies and then also the work uh, that I did in Afghanistan with women who are really taking, I think, a lot of charge of their own futures and the future of their country. Um, SMASH Strategies, as you mentioned, uh, is a firm uh, that I co-founded. And what we do is work with organizations, both private and public sector organizations, companies, large institutions, to really help them think about how to integrate gender into their work. And we look at it in terms of business strategy, procurement, philanthropy, and obviously how em employees are treated. Um, although we don't really focus only on that, what we find is that businesses do well when their work both internally and externally is consistent, uh, is consistent so that people see that whatever they're talking about for others uh, is what they do internally. And we really find that that helps motivate the business to be more uh, effective and to be more profitable, employees to be more engaged, customers are, are you know, see that that consistency is something that's important to them. And so we've been able in the last four years to really work with a broad range of companies, multilateral institutions, including UN Women on the WEPs, and I know we might talk about that later, and also uh, nonprofits. So it's really been a, a, an amazing, I think, experience for me looking at how uh, organizations across all these different sectors and types of, uh, you know, whether it's profit focused or not, are thinking about how to integrate gender equality and women's leadership into their work. And I think it, we're seeing that more and more. When I started this work oh so many years ago, I think it was, it was kind of a novelty. And now I, I think we see so many more entities really focused on this, again, because customers care about it, because the employees of the, of the firm or the nonprofit care about it, and because it's the right thing to do in terms of the correct thing morally, but also, you know, the research shows us, as I think many people on this call know, that uh, companies that do invest in women, companies that have more diverse teams, more diverse leadership, uh, really do better uh, in terms of profitability and effectiveness. So that that's essentially what our firm does. Before I uh, co-founded Smash Strategies, as you mentioned, I was at the U.S. State Department. Uh, I worked in the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues uh, for about three and a half years and also served at the embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan for about, uh, for over a year, maybe a little bit more than that, uh, focusing on women in civil society. <clears throat> and during that time, I was really honored and privileged to be able to travel around the country and uh, meet with a lot of Afghan women and, and civil society groups and really talk to them about what they are, were doing to move forward uh, Afghan society. So I know there are some pictures up on the screen. I always like to show, you know, Afghanistan is very different in terms of what it looks like than people think about often. It's obviously a beautiful country um, that's been, you know, I think scarred by civil war and war for 40 to 50 years. Uh, and obviously it's a difficult time right now. I don't want to underestimate how uh, challenging it is in terms of uh, especially focusing on what will happen uh, to the role of women in any kind of power sharing or agreement that goes forward with regard to uh, the Afghan government and the Taliban. But what I saw particularly, I think, relevant to this conversation is just how many Afghan women were really focused on rebuilding uh, their communities, their families, and the country uh, throughout various sectors, the business sector, the educational sector, and the public sector. I can talk about the statistics, but I, I think a couple of interesting things is that obviously uh, after the fall of the Taliban, many more women went back, uh, were able to go back to school, uh, were able to go to university, which one of the pictures on the screen is a group of men at the American University of Afghanistan, start businesses. Uh, another picture is of uh, a woman who I worked with quite a lot who uh, does beautiful clothing and actually I'm wearing a jacket made by her this morning uh, and has really been able to uh, use her talent and skill to develop a business in terms of selling, you know, again, really beautiful clothing uh, in Afghanistan. So one of the things to mention here is the women who we worked with at the embassy uh, focused, uh, were focused on how to advocate with their own government about changing the laws uh, that would 
around women's business uh, development and entrepreneurship. They formed a group that's now called the Afghan Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and were able to really uh, advocate with the, U with the Afghan government around changes to the laws so that women would have more access to capital, uh, be able to form their businesses uh, in, a, in a way, be able to get a better you know, incentives in terms of uh, how they could move goods across borders. Uh, also in that, a, it's called AC, uh, ACCWI, um, provide skill development for women, help them understand how to navigate the system. And so I think it's a really good example of, uh, at the embassy, we helped them kind of strategize about how to do that. But really, they obviously took this on. Um, and this Afghan chamber has been in existence now uh, since about, for about eight to nine years, and really has been able to help move forward the idea of women's entrepreneurship, worked a lot with the Afghan government to, again, as I said, change the laws and make it easier for women to participate in the economy and really open that, that you know, uh, sector up in a way that really marshals all of the great skills and talent that women have and have been using in Afghanistan, uh, but in a way that really helps them to be more profitable uh, and be able to participate more in their, in their economic life of their country. So just in terms of these photos, because I like to tell people what they are, um, this is a class, obviously, of um, high school young women in uh, that's in um, the north of the country there. And then uh, when John Kerry was Secretary of State, he came to Afghanistan, and we uh, he met with a group of women uh, business leaders, and uh, that's the group there. And uh, one of the other women uh, who was in the the group is uh, well known because a book was written about her. Um, being a dressmaker during the Taliban years. Uh, her name is Kamila Siddiqui, and she's now in the Afghan government uh, in the Ghani administration. So basically, just to say, I think Afghanistan, you know, like many fragile countries, presents extreme challenges for women. Uh, but there are, I think, a lot of women who are really interested and able to move forward uh, to really think about how to bring others with them and how to ensure that they are able to talk to their own governments in the most effective way so that the laws that need to be changed are either changed or implemented so that they can more fully participate in society uh, in terms of economic uh, development and job growth. So I'm going to stop there. There's a tremendously lot more to talk about, but I wanted to just give you a snapshot of the work I've done uh, generally, and then the work specifically with regard to Afghanistan. So I look forward to hearing from the other speakers and, of course, answering questions as we continue in the panel. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, having founded CTG in Afghanistan and employing uh, over 15,000 staff there, uh, of which 20% are actually women, mm -hmm. uh, I, I can definitely share your not only love for the country, but also adm admiration for the Afghan women and, and their capabilities. So we've just had a question in from the audience, which I want to turn back to Laura from Mexico has asked if we can please repeat the seven principles. And you're a bit of an expert um, when it comes to the web. So given your sort of in-depth understanding, perhaps you can explain a little bit more about the webs and, and how they can be used as a tool to promote women's equal participation in the economy, but perhaps you can also share with us a little bit about the UN Women project you were recently involved in, uh, which focused on increasing the number of web signatories. Oh, sure, of course. And there are seven principles of the WEPs, um, and everything from uh, increased uh, high-level corporate leadership, uh, the treatment, fair treatment of men and women at the workplace, ensuring health and safety, education and training, uh, more women-owned businesses and supply chains, uh, community involvement, and obviously also uh, the ability to ensure that we're measuring the progress that is made. Um, I, my firm worked uh, very recently on a project with UN Women on women's empowerment principles, as you said, and it was a very, it was quite interesting. We, we focused on a couple of things. One, though, specifically was really trying to get uh, companies in the U.S., Canada, and Japan, and other G7 countries to uh, think about signing up to the WEPs, 
to focus on uh, the work they were already doing that was consistent with the WEPs, and then you know helping each other uh, learn about what practices have worked for them and where they're, they need sort of peer learning. So during that time, you know, it's interesting because as you said, I think these are very uh, fundamental principles. And the thing that was the most interesting to me was really talking to a lot of businesses, um, corporations in the US about how basically they're already doing a lot of, uh, they're doing these things, right? These are fundamental principles. We uh, don't wanna discriminate, you know, the law says we don't discriminate against people. We provide for uh, health and safety um, and all the things that the WEPs stand for it's really a matter of getting companies to think about, you know, signing on this framework so that they're able to use it to talk about the work they're doing. Again, both internal to their company uh, in terms of how, how employees are treated, how they're engaging with uh, the community, how they are, um, you know, trying to increase the number of women-owned businesses in their supply chains, and really all, also obviously across all of this, ensure that there's high level corporate leadership uh, to address all of these issues. I mean, I think the one sort of the most interesting and challenging in a way uh, principle for a lot of companies, um, and not because they don't wanna do this, but is that I think this is sort of where it's a little bit on the, the kind of the cutting edge is ensuring that they're able to really increase the number of women owned uh, businesses in supply chains. And I think a lot of that goes to just how businesses and organizations work every day. We all, if we're successful, um, you know, we get our products or services from companies that we deal with. And if they work, they work. So how do you think about looking at new companies and bringing them in? And so that, that I think is something that a lot of companies are grappling with. Do they think about uh, every set, five years, really sort of refreshing who they do business with, how they think about procuring goods and services, uh, you know, and then how to develop those women-owned businesses to be able to really meet whatever the needs are that that company has. Uh, and there are groups that help companies do that, uh, help the women-owned businesses do that, and companies you know, sort of connect up. Uh, we Connect International is one of those entities that helps women-owned businesses connect with uh, large companies helps them uh, figure out what the requirements are. And, you know, for a lot of, I'm going to use an example uh, because this is a, a company that is worldwide. So something, a company like Walmart, which purchases a lot of goods and services, obviously as a retailer, you know, has very strict requirements about the kind of, um, you know, the kind of things they, they want the, their, their, uh, suppliers to do. And so really helping women-owned business under, businesses be able to meet those requirements, understand those requirements. So I think there's a lot of work that's been going on, particularly in the supply chain um, a, a women's empowerment principle, which is number five. But really what we saw is just there's a lot of interest out there in terms of companies being able to learn from each other and use these principles as a framework across sectors because there's, there's a lot that, uh, you know, sectors think of themselves as very different, but in a lot of ways, they, they really face a lot of the same issues in terms of how to ensure that they're being consistent internally and externally in terms of the principles, and then that they're able to learn uh, from each other about what works and, and what hasn't worked, which is uh, often something we don't talk about, but is, it can be very, very useful. Uh, if there's something that hasn't worked, Maybe it works in a different sector, but it doesn't work in yours, but being able to link up those companies so that they can talk to each other. Okay, thank you very much, Stephanie. So I'm, I'm now gonna move on to our next panelist, um, Asha. Please, can you tell us a little bit about your personal journey? Uh, you were born in Somalia, but then you moved to Canada and you've uh, returned now to Somalia. What was it like to return to Somalia? And why um, have the, country circumstances at the time led you to help set up the Somali Women's Leadership in Initiative. You are just on mute. Excellent. We have Sorry about now. that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, Alice. And um, uh, thank you, everybody, and hi, 
uh, the panelists. Um, my name is Asha Abdul Siad. Uh, I'm the executive director for Somali Women's Leadership Initiative. And my background is education. Uh, so if I take you a little bit uh, back, my life history, uh, in, 2000, in 1982, I graduated from, uh, in, I graduated from a College of Education here in Somalia. And I was a high school teacher uh, for a while, and then got married, have children, then started working for the USAID uh, in Somalia. And while I was vacationing alone in Italy, the civil war broke. And my husband has been killed uh, in January uh, 1991. So it took me three years to reunite with my three children. And uh, International uh, Red Cross took a major part to reunite uh, my children with me. So. So another two years in Italy, I figured that you know it's not the right place to, to raise them or educate them. Uh, when the you know country, Italian country at the time was in major major uh, unemployment rate. So I proceeded and requested refuge in Canada. So I landed in Toronto with my three children and then moved to Ottawa. Uh, schooling and raising my three kids, two boys and a girl, uh, and working there in Ottawa as family resource facilitator, working with the newcomers, families and children and parents, you know, in educating them how to integrate uh, the new country that they arrived in. So I came twice to visit my mother who was in Somalia, once in 2005, uh, and one one another time 2010 then i you know applied for a job in 2012 as technical advisor for the ministry of education in somalia uh, i got the job i came 2000 february 2013 uh, for a one-year contract as technical advisor um, uh, supported by unicef so when i finished my one-year contract and at that time i took one year leave from Canada from my full-time permanent job in Ottawa, uh, I saw the need for the education sector, uh, the girls' education, uh, the, in, the women's education, education in general. So I decided to quit my job in Canada and stay back since my children were grown and uh, some of them were in university. I said I have to help my people, uh, you guys take care of yourself. So I ended up staying since then. I, I went back once as delegate from Somali National University to Canada to, uh, to York University. I was here. In 2014, uh, I co-founded with Somali Women's Leadership Initiative. And we have been working mostly in women political participation because at that time, uh, women were not in the parliament or in the uh, institutions or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and the country was also going into federalism and they were uh, in the process of uh, forming federal member states. And we wanted those federal member states, women to be part in that administration. So we lobbied, we advocated, and 2016, I was not there 2012, so uh, we had 12% in the parliament at that time. But the next election was 2016. So 2016, we lobbied and advocated and recruited, you know, a woman and encouraged women to be part of this federal uh, parliament and, and the Senate also. So uh, I trained 20 young university graduates from, uh, from the universities in Mogadishu. 
in, in, in advocacy, in mediation, conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and then I divided them into the five federal member states and the Nadir to advocate for a 30% quota that women were asking. And the election was at that time was not one person, one vote, since the country was coming out from uh, interim uh, government and it became permanent uh, sovereign country. Then uh, we didn't have the mechanism or the uh, you know uh, political uh, or election law on, on com election committee. So they want uh, a model that doesn't even exist in the world. Only Somalia uses that model. It's a clan power sharing, which is four major clans and one uh, minority clan. So, and the woman, when it comes to clan elders and religious leaders, they don't have the chance to become MPs or even to participate in government uh, uh, positions. So we advocated and we uh, educated those young women, divided to the region. And then by the time the election was over and they came back, six of them became MPs. They used the skills and the you know advocacy and you know what we trained uh, them to become to lobby for themselves from their clan and from their society. So they came back uh, as MPs. So that time, so the those young girls. The first one now is a minister of women, a minister of women and, in, and, and human rights development. So when, so from there, I see that the young women, if they are given the skills that they need to try, they will succeed and they will accomplish and you know go through any obstacle that faces them. So. Uh, if I go back to the 30% quota that we are lobbying for, now in the parliament, in this federal parliament that already is their, uh, their term ended, we have 24%. And that 24% came during that time that we lobbied and advocated for the women political participation. Uh, one should be women. So there have been a degree from the president at that time uh, issued be a woman. The second thing that we managed to uh, to secure was to have women to serve seats. So those uh, seats they have to be reserved for only women to contest. So that's how we manage it to have the 24% that we are having now. The other thing that we managed to succeed at the time was the registration fee. At the time, it was uh, 10,000 for the men to register to become an MB and 5,000 for the women to register. So we managed to reduce the fee of the woman to 50%. So they were paying 25% just to encourage women to be part of of this, you know, a federal administration or federal parliament and the Senate. So we managed all those things at that time. Now, now is the time for election. Instead of going one person, one vote, we are going back to 4.5, which is clan-based power sharing. Uh, and this is not good for the for the woman because clan elders and religious leaders are deciding who will become MB in their clan. So and they don't want women. So we are still lobbying for the, this government uh, that their term ended in February uh, eighth. The president who is sitting now, his term ended February this year, and the parliament ended. December, uh, the term of the parliament ended uh, December last year. So now we are asking them to issue those degrees to have a 50% reduction of the of the fee, which even this year has been increased to 20,000 and 10,000. So if they get that, they have to be to pay 50%. The other thing we want to secure is to have the reserve seats that 
you know, we had girls in Philippines uh, and so on and so forth. So women in Somalia, if they get the chance, if they get the skills, if they get the education, they they can do a lot. They can uh, surpass when you know the challenges that are put in front of them of them from the religious leaders or the clan elders. So it's patriarchal uh, society that we are living in, but women need the support. And if we give them that support, they will uh, go forward. The other thing is that you know I managed to do is to uh, to focus on the higher education in the in in girls. So when they get into the university, we empower them to become uh, teachers, for example, for 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 the young you know uh, primary classes uh, for higher. Uh, normally they 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 are intimidated to become a teacher for high or secondary school because secondary school the students are you know are teenagers and they are very challenging so they rest, they don't respect women so but i was encouraging them to take that education um, uh, degree to become high uh, you know secondary school teachers i have done that and and it was great but it needs a courage, it needs determination, it needs education, it, lean, it needs encouragement, because this last 30 years or 25 years, the country was in chaos. Uh, we didn't have, you know, uh, uh, good governance or, you know, there was warlords and, you know, uh, things that didn't happen or systems that didn't happen women, help women. So what is the work of Suali? Suali the Somali Women's Leadership Initiative uh, it specifically focuses on women political participation, women in leadership, uh, conflict resolution, prevention, reconciliation, gender-based violence uh, against women, uh, to encourage women to become their independent uh, uh, selves. So even economic empowerment, we help them uh, on the bank and encourage them, introduce them to the you know uh, higher level of uh, of the banks and organizations. Uh, so what we need now for Swali? Swali, I saw the power of education. I saw the power of giving skills uh, to the young girls to graduate from university. I saw because here. Uh, there's early marriage problem. The young girls, once they, you know, hit the property, they automatically, you know, uh, forced to marry. They get married. So I encourage them, even if they are married, to continue with their studies, uh, give them their skills, uh, skills to, you know, to overcome all these obstacles, to encourage them and become, you know, uh, a strong woman. So those kind of things. So in my vision now what I have is Somali Women Leadership Initiative to be to become Somali Women Leadership Institute. So I my focus now, now is to have an institute to train these young women in leadership and so that they can be part of the decision making tables. We don't have uh, you know any woman in those uh, uh, top seats of the government. So that's our uh, vision, and that's what we are looking into, and see how we can uh, establish that initiative uh, for the soon, for the near future. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I think I'm not the only person judging by the chat who's very inspired by your story and, and, and work you're doing. Um, but actually, you, you talk a little bit about focusing on higher education. So that gives me the opportunity to uh, introduce our next uh, speaker, um, Isad Abu Malou. Um, Isad, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what it's been like growing up in Gaza and what led you to set up the Oxford English Centre. Thank you, Alice, for having me today. Um, first of all, I was uh, born and raised in a refugee camp 
in the middle area of the Gaza Strip, uh, receiving education and health services from the UNRWA, which is the United Nations Agency for Relief and Work. It's a work agency for work agency for relief um, of the Palestinian refugees. My, um, the primary, my primary education or my educational journey in, in general was interrupted by uh, conflict um, and civil unrest. In my primary school, um, I witnessed the first intifada and the situation uh, wasn't really stable. Uh, horrific scenes that children should not see and our education as children back then was interrupted by public strikes, um, armed conflict, uh, etc. Um, um, soon after this, a second intifada broke out when I was at prep school and uh, finally at my high school stage, an, an unfortunate military coup took place as well. So you can imagine that throughout the early uh, years of my education, uh, it was interrupted and severely affected uh, by the civil unrest and the armed conflict in, in Gaza. You know, military escalation all the time. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy at all to grow up in such an environment, for a woman in particular. Uh, what, what, made, what made it absurd to me as a child back then, that as a child I was bombarded with concepts beyond my understanding, things related you know, to national heroism. As a child, you know, you, you can't just understand what's going on. Um, following the years of my education and after this military coup, and uh, I was at, at the university, um, the unemployment rates rocketed in Gaza, and the Gaza Strip was in the hands of, uh, of Hamas, a military group here. Uh, they took over the Gaza Strip. And um, personally, I received like um, this threat, uh, life, uh, life threats, uh, you know, things related to my to my appearance. In fact, that they wanted me to, to dress the Islamic way. Uh, that incident was in 2007, right after that military coup, and. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I stood my ground back then, and I had to fight that battle. Uh, I reported the incident to human rights organizations, and I reported it to the police. And um, uh, unfortunately, before uh, graduation, another military incident or another security incident took place in the British Council in Gaza. Uh, so they, the British Council of Gaza determined uh, uh, terminated all of the. Uh, works and operations in the Gaza Strip. They stopped offering any language education to uh, uh, Gaza uh, language learners. And as a graduate of English literature, it was an unfortunate thing for me because it was like a, a hindrance. Uh, it would stop my progression towards having a master's degree or carrying on with my higher education. So I, the chances were so limited back then and I had to search for alternatives. I needed my IELTS test uh, to be able to apply for scholarships to study in the year. It was a great challenge and I, I remember back then that I made a crazy investment in a uh, a diploma designed for senior managers was offered by Cambridge uh, International Examinations and I succeeded in that international diploma. I applied for that diploma and it was like an equivalent for the IELTS test and I managed to uh, get into university. I was offered a scholarship uh, to study in the UK uh, right after I established the organization I lead now. So in, in, uh, after graduation, I had to find a job opportunity for myself, for my sister, uh, because of unemployment, obviously. So because of the experience I went through and the obstacles I encountered throughout the years, um, I made my mind that there should be alternatives for the British Council established language school called the Oxford English Centre. And in the UK, I did a master's degree in TESOL. It was in teaching English to speakers of other languages. I did my dissertation in how to brand uh, and how to work in, you know, having a, a good business model for a language school, uh, uh, a private sector language school. That was my dissertation. And I came back to Gaza. Um, uh, you know, it was a victory back then because I was one of the, you know, it was I was one of the earliest uh, or the, the first woman, perhaps in my tribe, 
to travel abroad without the company of a man. Uh, I, I descended from Bedouin background, which is a minority in Gaza, and they have some tribal strict rules in that sense that women uh, mobility is not something really strict and they can't travel unaccompanied by a, a male member of the family or the tribe. So I finished my master's degree in the University of Nottingham after receiving a, a competitive scholarship. It was called the Said Foundation Scholarship. And um, uh, it was given based on um, uh, academic excellence and also uh, based on my developmental contribution to the Levant region. I came back to Gaza and I worked on progressing the, the institution I lead. Unfortunately, uh, the, the war broke out in 2014. The center was completely destroyed and I had to rebuild. So the challenges I encountered throughout the journey in my business institution, uh, they were not so easy. And you know, the situation in Gaza wasn't easy at all. Um, uh, I worked on branding the institution and after that, you know, targeting women from marginalized backgrounds and preserved communities, particularly the Bedouin women. So I used the center as a platform to exert social influence on those preserved communities. And I managed uh, and succeeded in recruiting staff members from the Bedouin community as well and assisted tens of these students to continue their education abroad. So um, in 2018, I was offered a second scholarship to study in the UK also. It was sponsored by the British General Consulate, the FCO. And uh, that was based on um, um, my, my leadership potential in a global setting. Uh, I did a second master's degree in the University of Bristol. I did a Shakespeare and Renaissance Literature master's degree. And the aim was I need to reform education because I need to do something about it. Um, um, uh, we did lots of initiatives and since the business model we adopt in the center is SDG oriented, we worked on gender equality, we worked on um, economic growth, particularly for women, and also an equality education. That was the heart of uh, our work here in Gaza. Uh, we wanted to provide uh, an alternative to the of the British Council here and a paradigm for quality education and I'm so glad um, uh, to announce that we we managed to get a partnership with Oxford University Press and now I would be able to have an international testing system here in Gaza accredited abroad which would be a fantastic opportunities for women in Gaza uh, to fulfill their potential and to complete their higher education abroad um, it, it would be a great step and we hope that in the, in the near future uh, we take it to the next level like announcing it and promoting it further um, uh, so um, the, the contribution back the contribution I wanted to make back to my community uh, was driven by personal experience, first of all, was driven by social constraints uh, women encounter in here, and also, uh, you know, commitment to the delivery of a quality education to my community. I wanted to do something because uh, politics itself uh, wasn't an easy um, wasn't an easy gate for me, you know, to exert influence or to participate in the political life. The political life in Palestine is almost dead after the division between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. So it's not easy here in Gaza to participate in the political life. Or, um, so education is the only resort for us to contribute to the development of the region. So uh, we work on the capacity building of young people through um, enhancing their language of proficiency levels. And this would in the future help them to, um, to grow economically and to become the authors of their own development here in the center. Uh, we were uh, encountered by severe challenges after this unfortunate division uh, between the, the West Bank and Gaza because this situation of civil unrest where uh, people are divided politically and ideologically here wasn't easy on academic and educational settings. So we managed to create this mediating atmosphere for everyone to thrive and to grow in this institution. And um, yes, um, so we, you could see here people from different backgrounds, the Christians, Muslims, the more preserved people, Bedouin, everyone from all backgrounds, they can thrive here. In the past few years, we are so happy to say that the majority of people who travel abroad continue their 
education or scholarships when not, they are Oxford Center alumni. They are our ex students. So I think 80% of people were chosen by the British uh, consulate in the past few years were my students, including Selwa herself. You know, Selwa, the woman you referred to, she was one of my students as well. So we are doing a great job here with women. And um, we, yeah, I, I'm so glad that the the, the preconceived notions about women education abroad somehow started to change in Gaza and nowadays women can travel abroad, women can, you know, uh, fulfill their potential and grow academically and, and uh, in turn they can enhance their uh, economic growth as well. Because as you know, um, people with, with good levels of English language, a uh, high level of, uh, of the proficiency of English language, they are up to three times as much uh, to get work, uh, to get jobs and to be paid like three, three times more than people with poor levels of English language of proficiency. And that was a challenge. There was a gap in the formal education at Gaza universities, and we tried to fill that gap. Um, now, graduates of different departments, they come to this institution to enhance the level in order to enhance their future chances to get uh, a good job opportunity and an opportunity to grow or to travel abroad or um, to create their own um, uh, um, job opportunities themselves because many of them, you know, uh, have either started their private businesses, some of them, you know, migrated abroad and generally uh, we are doing a great job with YOF in here when we are so proud of the capacity building uh, schemes we run every now and then. And thanks to you, Alice, and thanks to C, uh, uh, CTG in the past years, uh, we were more aware and were more informed about the importance of orienting or, and integrating SDGs in our business model. We were doing things uh, without understanding, you know, the formal frame of things. We had this commitment, um, but we didn't have the guidelines in order to establish our own action plan to implement such goals. But uh, in 2018, just before I traveled to the UK, we launched an Oxford community where we um, uh, launched this um, community service platform uh, to, to well, an inviting one uh, to recruit volunteers from our students and members of the community, friends, uh, to, to have initiations and their own initiatives in different levels. Um, uh, and they contribute to different goals of the SDGs. Like I'm proud to say also that one of the board, uh, the member of board of directors, she co-founded the first uh, animal shelter in Gaza. It's the only one in Gaza and they are working, they are doing a great job with animals nowadays. So luckily we have now a shelter in Gaza for animals and this was um, in cooperation with Oxford community. So we're doing lots of initiatives in Gaza and it seems like regardless of this absurdity we live in, somehow we can find ways, we can um, uh, adapt with the situation and we can you know, push further boundaries uh, in terms of sustainable development. Uh, so uh, I'm grateful, Alice, for everything your organization is doing in Gaza. Salva was a source of inspiration for you, but you were our source of inspiration. So I really appreciate everything you're doing here. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's, uh, I, I have to say that you're getting a lot of comments um, in the chat as well. And I agree with you that your achievements have been really fantastic. Um, sorry, something's happened to my screen. Um, your achievements have actually been really very fantastic and you are extremely inspiring. There was someone's question, Aisha Tembe, um, who actually had a question around the youth, which I would like to come back to um, in a moment. Um, I would actually like to say that I've had the uh, pleasure of visiting the Oxford English Centre in Gaza and the work you're doing really is very inspiring. We've had the uh, privilege as well of, of working in partnership with um, the Oxford English Centre, an initiative that aligns the WEPS, particularly principle number four for education and training for career development. Um, we launched our for, uh, female first career development workshops in Gaza in partnership with uh, ISAD and her organisation. Um, and it's a project that underpins CCG's flagship Females First initiative um, and aims to create job readiness uh, workshops for women in conflict settings. I think we had a hundred women that joined um, our workshop in Gaza and uh, we've run similar workshops in, in Somalia actually and hope to reignite them 
later in, in 2021. Though COVID has not completely uh, stopped our progress, we have used that time to continue developing our committed to good curricula into a series of 10 education modules to streamline the delivery of workshops across multiple conflict affected countries. So anyway, Sadia, um, I think you'd be very quiet over there. Um, I'd like to come back to Somalia now and ask you to tell us a little bit about how you were affected by the conflict in Somalia and how conflict in Somalia affects women's business opportunities and women's economic empowerment. And if I could ask you to please keep to about 10 minutes um, because there are quite a lot of questions coming through and I would like to try and address some of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, yes, I'm from uh, Mogadishu, Somalia, and I came um, to Nairobi um, as a refugee going to Denmark. Um, and when I arrived in um, Denmark, um, the first question that my social worker asked me is, what can I do to help you? I was very skinny, black, Muslim refugee girl. And the first um, question I asked her was, when will I go to school? Um, and she couldn't believe. She stood up and she said, I have been working with an immigrant, uh, mainly um, Turkish and um, refugees from Bosnia and so on and so forth, and Somalia as well, uh, because that was back in 20, uh, to, no, 1994. Um, so I didn't ask her food or house or anything else, but when will I go? to actually go to school and learn the language so that I can get an education. I was doing that because back in Somalia, what I could remember was like, you know, the agony, the pain, the difficulties. I lost my grandmother um, to tuberculosis. Um, my auntie was severely, um, you know, ill. Um, luckily she survived. Um, and then the civil war. Um, so I actually prayed that if I ever had the opportunity to come to abroad and survive um, and get an education from zero to the highest level of PhD, that I will come back and be part of uh, to rebuild Somalia. So that was my promise to the country. And, and I remember I was making prayers uh, when I was living uh, from Somalia to Kenya. Um, through Kenya to, to, to Denmark. Uh, and it was that faith and um, belief that kept me all the way um, to UK, where I actually done my education um, and set it up uh, a charity called um, EVA Organization for Women, uh, EOW charity, through the help um, of my university, University of Leicester. Um, so the, the, the charity was a bridge between marginalized or underrepresentative, um, how can I say, women in, and youth and their families in Leicester. Um, and we were working on FGM or gender violence um, issues and employment trainings, you know, uh, political participations. Uh, we have been part of um, the British uh, Parliament, how women in the UK could be part of the, um, you know, um, decision making um, can be part of the table, actually. And um, so um, in 2011, um, there was a severe drought and famine in Mogadishu. Uh, and my children have never seen my parents. So for me, it was an opportunity um, to take to my children, to my uh, family. Um, majority of them were in a refugee camp in, in Kenya. Um, and my dad was um, in Mogadishu, he was a police officer. So I took them to Kenya um, and then went to Somalia to do small um, voluntary work. Um, to help women, um, so we gave them um, 500 US dollar and each, um, and then so that they can start their own businesses. Uh, it was sponsored by our uh, members uh, as well as the staff at the University of Leicester, um, and then um, through there, um, I actually met a couple of men, um, Somali men who wanted actually to start a university. 
Um, and then I tried um, to explain that Somalia have enough university, almost over 70, 80 uh, universities, um, but there was a gap, uh, and the gap was academic progression and Polytechnic Academy. At the time, I had no idea what I was talking about because TVET or technical vocational education um, training was not my background. Um, so I just said it uh, and I was naively believing them that they were sincere what they were talking about because like they said yes that's true you know and then we discussed and had amazing plan and I was so excited and even the plan I went to to Somalia part of it was setting up a hospital and um, medical diagnostic center and but i had to put it aside because i saw a gap like human capacity like um the lack of it like human resource like we have people but they don't have the capacity and they don't have skills and i saw women um affected most i remember one of the females that we helped and and, and there is a story that was being written um, and on somewhere on the internet, and they were selling uh, meat on the um, on the floor, like literally on the ground, um, and like that was the condition. And people were coming; all the flies were around them, so the condition was very, very, very tough on women. So we had to help those few women and invest them and set it up their businesses. So when I came back. Um, I spoke to our board and then they said, let us start and build the library. Um, because there were a lot of students who were asking me to send them books. Um, and then we said, okay, instead of sending books to individual students, isn't it is better to build the, um, the, the library? So um, my um, trip in 2013, we found out that there was also another organization who was doing it that specifically so we said okay let us donate to these organizations um, who although we had um like the go ahead from the somali government we had to have a buddha site and then i had to focus on an hano academy and in 2014 i registered an hano academy which is academic progression and polytechnic academy so we provide english language uh, mainly english cambridge and on IELTS, uh, we are the first uh, pre testing and exam center. Um, and although we are not proper exam center, yet again, our students can take online, um, thanks to the um, British Consul in Nairobi. Um, I had uh, some contacts from them, and we have been trying to work, um, you know, to have uh, exam center in Somalia, but there were a lot of issues because of the security mainly. Um, and then what we do through that so the academy contains five uh, components so the first one is and uh, languages um, mainly english language and um, professional development courses specifically um, for the civil servant so we provide training for government officials um, and um, university graduates and so on and so forth and then the second component is TVET, technical and vocational education training from hair and beauty and hospitality and catering, construction, solar energy, electrician, you name it. We are hands on academy. And if you see our logo, you will understand like it is two hands. So the top one is that protection. The bottom one is like, you know, caring, welcoming, and it is hands on academy. So we provide and the, um, those um, trainings, we don't do everything at one go, like specifically like now, um, we are doing um, beekeeping, like women in, in Balaat, um, in Hirshavele are uh, producing um, honey. And hopefully, you know, you will see, soon see Alice and those females, uh, and it is uh, retainees um, from other countries, thanks to the IOM. It is uh, in partnership with the IOM that we are implementing, um, and also farming and sector. And we have created a cooperative, a female-led cooperatives, 
um, where they can actually um, generate an income. So the second component for the academy um, is that we um, set it up um, the first the social innovation hub. It is um, an incubator um, for job creation, employment, and entrepreneurship. Um, and um, through there, we actually support um, our beneficiaries or our students um, to um, either create their own businesses or help them to get employment elsewhere. Or those who want to uh, get a um, higher education, they can actually um, benefit all those scholarships that um, that is available for them. So in 2019, uh, with uh, in, um, the Somali Minister of Education and the the EU. Um, um, Delegates uh, led by the ambassador, we launched Erasmus Plus. It is a full funded um, scholarship uh, and it was only open for the uh, European students, but now it is open also for the Somalis, Kenyans, Ethiopians, and other countries. It is not a, a globally, but it is actually for some countries. Um, the other component that we do is research and consultancy because that is where I have started. I just said something that I wasn't, um, that I wasn't, I didn't know what it was, Tibet. And so what I have done is that back in 2011, uh, when I came back to the UK, I had to educate myself and do a research. And the research we call the three E's, employment and education, employment and empowerment. Um, and we focus to women and young girls. Um, so we run um, and that uh, component as well. And the last one is um, cultural heritage uh, and Somali literacy and advocacy. Um, my mom used to produce um, Somali um, clothes that is handmade. Um, and because of um, a lot of Somali people going abroad and go specifically to China, um, they were not making a lot of profits. So what I have realized is that those old men that my mom used to work with her, um, are majority of them are dead and few who are still alive, their knowledge is, nobody is actually um, heriting it. So we wanted actually to preserve that cultural heritage and specifically those trainings. Um, for at Hano Academy, we actually run um, sessions for women in, um, in uh, leadership, um, in economical development. One of the issues that we face is that um, more than 70% of Somali women um, has no education. Those who actually got to universities, it is very difficult for them to get employment. Why? because for becoming owned by male are afraid of like if we hire women like they will be huge childcare they will be like she will get married you know as soon as she finishes and she gets um a job and she feels comfortable and then like what can i do like and i can't fire her because her clan and her husband will come to us so it is much better for us to leave them alone and um, so we propose them like you know if you hire them we will provide uh, the nursery and opportunity for them you know for child care so another um, big dilemma that we also help uh, women to overcome is business investment um, yes it's great you know to have you know women um, you know in political and uh, arena but what we need is that women in financial independence. They are the backbone of the society. They are out there. If you go to the market, you will see women everywhere, you know, in business, every sector, but they are not where they should be. Why? Because of they don't have the support, especially financial and investment. And if you don't have that financial investment, and if you have a brilliant idea, but no man wants to partner with you, it's very difficult. You can have the best idea, but nobody wants you because you are a woman. And if they want you because it is you look, 
and you have to give something back to them. Uh, one of our, later on, she became our student. What happened to her was as soon as she finished university, there were men, like, offer, like there were this man offering her a job, but he wasn't offering her the job, but he wanted her in the bed. So those are the sad situations that we have to raise awareness and say, you know what, you can, if there is no a seat in the table, you have to create that. You have to bring your own chair and sit there and tell what you want and have the account accountability for the, for the government. Yes, you know, they are living a luxury life, you know, um, you know with blue, blue cars and comfortable houses. While women in the you know society are struggling in many aspects, for for us yes education is number one priority, but we are focusing women, their role in the society in in the private sector's role for women to actually have the voice and have the opportunity to be invested, and still. Um, we haven't seen a great success stories, per se, um, for investment yet, but, but we are trying to do little by little. Um, yes, they give us small grants, you know, but that's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is that innovative idea, like women in STEM. We set it up the first STEM um, um, initiative in Somalia, like science, technology, engineering, and ma mathematics. And when I was talking STEM, they, people were saying, are you crazy? You talk about STEM in Somalia? That is unheard of. Like, we have other things to worry about. Let's forget about that. Specifically women in STEM. Um, so we need um, not only the, 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 the women um, to, to, to actually say that we need that, but we have to show them. Um, because if we don't demonstrate how it is like to be a woman in, 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 in the private sector, how women are struggling financially, how women are um, actually paying more price than male, is, 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 is actually uh, difficult. So thank you for the opportunity. I leave it to you, Alice. Thank you. I'm going to interrupt you there. Your energy and enthusiasm for Somalia, Somalia and helping women there is, is infectious, I have to say. But um, there are lots of questions and I really want to come on to some of them. Um, Grace G has asked a question and got quite an amusing answer from another uh, attendee. But I want to answer this question to Stephanie. Um, you've, I'm sure you've learned a lot of, quest, uh, of lessons from trying to promote gender equality and women's economic empowerment in Afghanistan and other countries. And, and Grace has asked, how does the strategy for implementing the WEPs in fragile and conflict affected countries differ from the strategy in countries which wouldn't be considered conflict affected? Um, how, try and answer that. You know, first of all, I, I would step back by saying, I mean, part of the reason we do this work globally, we meeting all of us on this call and governments that invest in uh, women's in women abroad and companies that do is because, well, the women on this call are a great example, but the research shows us that uh, when co countries do that and when companies do that, uh, we release the talent and skills of half the population and we build uh, stronger economies, more stable economies, and in the long run, for all of us, it's better for global security because when, when countries are prosperous and there are jobs, we have an easier time, you know, creating uh, a level playing field for people as challenging as it is, and we have an easier time creating uh, economies that actually provide for people. So I think we need to, you know, always remember that we do this work of course, because it's the right thing to do, but in the long run, it's better for global security and prosperity. And obviously we we are all in a, a situation now where COVID has taught us that, uh, you know, we're, we're very interconnected and uh, that what happens in one place has an impact everywhere else. And so I think specifically to how these frameworks like the WEPs or like the SDGs differ or, frankly, global frameworks uh, or national frameworks, it's really about using them uh, as a way to look at what the issues are in your country 
uh, and, and how to move forward. So what do I mean by that? We all in, in every country faces issues around the, uh, the need to ensure that uh, there's adequate education and skill training, like we've talked about on the call, that there's adequate access to capital, that people are treated fairly, um, that women and other marginalized groups are able to participate fully in the economy and sell their goods and services to large companies or to governments or you know, obviously to consumers. So really the WEPs are a framework. And I think it's not so much that the WEPs differ on their face in the conflict affected countries uh, versus more developed or less conflict affected countries, but they give people a roadmap and they give people guideposts so that as they're looking to move forward, you know, you can see that those are places that are sort of the universally accepted principles of things that are important to really develop strong economies and societies where everyone has the ability to participate men and women, people of all ages, people of different ethnic groups. So these are really ways to think about moving forward. And you know, we all can't work on everything all the time. So they, they also provide, I think, a way to say, I'm working on education or I'm working on skill development or capital access and allowing us all to see the interconnection between these issues. Because I think one thing that often, um, you know, we all get in our little silos and we do our work. But I think the most effective, you know, sort of thinking about this understands that we can't do one thing without the other, right? We can't ask women or anyone else to really participate fully in the economy or public life or run for office if they're not well educated, uh, have access to skills, have access to uh, healthcare systems, uh, can live lives free from violence, uh, that's gender-based violence or conflict-affected violence, uh, you know, or, and without the ability to participate in decisions made about their lives. And so all of this is interconnected. And I think frameworks like the WEPs and the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, give us those, those roadmaps forward and help us understand, I think, in, in a more maybe formal way, what we all know informally is that, you know, everything we do in life is, is connected. And one, you have to have be moving forward on a lot of different issues at the same time, but they really give you that, that roadmap and framework. And again, allow you to have connections to people and companies and entities and other places who that have faced the same issues. So I always feel like I living in the U S am hardly the right person, you know, to really uh, be the right peer-to-peer -peer, uh, kind of uh, learning partner for someone in a conflict-affected country. But something like the WEPs and the SDGs can really help make those connections between people who's, who are in societies and communities that have more similar challenges. So I think it's really about uh, the framework, the holistic approach, and, and understanding the connections between the economy and politics and uh, all the other sectors of society writ large. I think it's really interesting to the connections that you talk about and I, I wondered whether Asha actually had anything to comment on that about how gender equality and uh, women's economic empowerment intersect and why women's participation in public life is actually critical to promote progress in Somalia. Asha, would you like to contribute to that? Yes, I'll... Uh... If the women are not in the public arena or in public administration, uh, there will not be a voice for women in those institutions. Uh, if all the men, if all the parliaments are filled with men, all the gender laws or women, you know, uh, uh, bills will not be considered or will not even be pass it or they will not into uh, they will not look into what's important for women and families uh, for instance now that we have 80 women in the parliament out of 275 we are still having challenges to pass a sexual offenses bill uh, 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 
build uh, uh, their policy. All those bills and policies and, you know, uh, are sitting in the parliament the last eight years because women are not majority in there uh, and men are taking over and rejecting, you know, the bills or that needs to be passed. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing, women are educated. Uh, and if they are educated, they have to be part of the Chinese development or uh, public institution uh, in all in all sectors. And if they are not, uh, you know, given the job, then that's another uh, challenge that women are facing. Educated, uh, graduated from a university, and not having a job. The other thing is seventy, approximately seventy percent of the country a population are women. So the workforce is missing when those 70% are not accommodated or not given positions in uh, institution. So it's a lot and a waste of resources, human resources in there. The country needs both men and women to, to develop. So that's why we are focusing and uh, striving to have a woman in the public institutions, in the parliament, in uh, in the Senate, uh, to become ministers. For instance, now we have, at the beginning we had six ministers, but now they reduce it to three. Every minister, woman that, you know, they, they uh, fire or they, you know, take the position from, from that woman, they replace with a man. So when you look at the 25 ministries that we have in our government, only three are women. So those three ministries are ministries of all 25 uh, uh, ministers of the government. Everybody knows that, and you know, and they actually talk about that. So women are not corrupt, and the country is. Uh, label it as the most corrupted country in the world. So if we have women in the public institution, the corruption will be less. We will benefit from their honesty and decency and hard work and, and uh, to develop uh, the country. So those are the kind of things that we are considering and, and focusing on having women in the public arena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asha. And I think it's really important. I think education is uh, really, really important. And I'd like to just quickly ask um, Isad and Sadia to pass some comments. Um, individually, what do each of you believe? Because uh, we only have a few minutes left now, sadly. Um, but why do you believe education is so important when it comes to empowering women? And perhaps, Isad, you can start by just talking about why you think it's critical to women in Gaza in just a few words. Yeah, women in Gaza are you know, severely affected by the political unrest uh, and the somehow dysfunctioning political system that impacts on the economic life with high rates of, un of unemployment amongst women in particular. Um, becoming financially independent and empowering women through education will allow them eventually to, come, to become financially independent and thus to make their own decisions and to have their voices heard in, the, in different domains. Uh, so we believe they can have uh, a major contribution to the public economy. They can um, have solutions uh, to obstacles the Gazans uh, go, you go through on a daily basis here. They are an important asset. Um, uh, human resources here in Gaza is something big. Uh, we have highly educated, overqualified ladies, young women, from across all the domains that through education, they can have major contribution uh, to research, to business, and also to diplomacy on the long run. We believe, we hope to see women in diplomacy on the long run as well. So yeah, it's an effective tool. It's number one tool. And for any Palestinian refugee, uh, it's a cliche for them. Like they always sell us as refugees, education is your only resort. Since I was a child, this was the thing 
I always kept in mind that we have no other result but education. And now, like growing, um, I, I, I started to grow to understand how empowering this for education from personal experience and also to compare women in my small community who are financially independent uh, to those who are dependent who can't have their own voices and, and thus their roles in the community are quite limited and this affects on the long run uh, as well um, on their performance in the public life um, it is very important that those educated women can can share and create a network of influencers who can um, inspire other women uh, in different areas and they can work together in the long run, like uh, to establish certain and you know to defy certain stereotypes about women roles in Gaza. So yes, education uh, is number one tool to change the economy, to change the political life, um, to change everything here for in, in Gaza. Yeah, we hire um, uh, hundreds of Palestinians in Gaza, and we do have a very very high level of education. Um, in, in Gaza, and that she mentioned Sawa before I forgot she'd gone through uh, law college to learn to speak English before she came to work for us. Um, Sadia, just one thing I really wanted to touch on, um, uh, Somalia has one of the highest GBV rates in the, in the world and we can't, we can't not mention it, but can you maybe talk about what does, the, does education for both men and women play in promoting an environment free from violence and harassment? We've touched on it a moment before. Yeah. Thank you, Alice. Um, let me touch why it is important to women to have an education. Well, I came from a family, generation of women without education. Forget about the school, like university or secondary school or higher education. Forget about that. Like basic education. Like my mom never had it. Even my old sister never went to school. My grandmother, my aunties, you name it, generation of families of women who never had an opportunity to get the education. So you can understand my passion of getting education or, you know, being the advocacy, being the voice. And I remember my mom was a businesswoman, so she took money and put it in a Somali bank. And right before the war happened, um, she was throwing um, some babies. And she threw away those babies because she, she couldn't read. And I saw it and I said, mom, this is a baby from the bank. And then she hugged me and cried. Again, another um, one is that when my grandmother was hospitalized, this doctor from Finland and, and he was treating her tuberculosis was explaining to us um, tuberculosis and how infectious it was. Sadly, my auntie who, like I tried to explain my mom, the other time my other family members came, nobody could communicate with them. And sadly, they got infected. Um, so education is the savior of life, whether um, your health and well-being, whether it is you want to earn money and get a job, because you need skills. Women on, in Somalia that we help through HANO Academy, um, for instance, one of the, like I was very surprised when I get to know that majority of women in Somalia are also farmers and fishery and all of that. Sadly, we have, there are a lot of suitcase organizations in Somalia who are getting the contracts but not the Somali women. So if I come back to your question, Alice, um, it has everything um, to do with uh, peace building, um, well-being, um, job creation, employment, you know, starting your own companies or all of that. Everything starts education because if you don't have the skills and the know-how, you cannot take a one step to actually engage. You can easily be brainwashed if you don't have the power to go to a library and have the opportunity to get a book and read yourself. You know, somebody can translate something wrongly and you can, through the education or through other ideology, education frees you in many ways that people has no idea. So I don't understand why we can't use education um, as a way to free the world and give people to have the opportunity. So in Somalia, it will, and it is playing a key role specifically 
if we focus of out of school children um, and young and youth, those are the people that are very, um, what can I say, um, um, a very um, bad, like difficult environment. And if we don't actually include, because majority of the Somali youth and women specifically um, are not those who are having an opportunity to go to school and going to universities. Those are getting help, but it is those people that we are leaving behind. And sadly, it is those, um, you know, we need to look into. So peace building, like um, to rebuild Somalia, we need to focus on education, skills, training, uh, and, and investment. Sadia, thank you so much. And I just want to conclude by firstly saying thank you all. Um, we've had over 100 participants um, on the call today, and it just goes to show um, how incredible our speakers have been today. Thank you so much for all of you who attended. I hope that um, what we've tried to share today is that the UN's Women's Empowerment Principles is not just uh, principles for businesses to look internally within their organizations, but actually how women's participation in public life how education, how everything plays a role um, in the whole gender equality makeup, and that actually businesses are, uh, you know, the, 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 the WEPS principles are actually just seven simple steps that businesses can take to start their gender equality journey and to start making uh, changes within their marketplace and within the communities that they work in. Um, and uh, just share one final slide here, which is how do you get involved with the webs? So you need to ask your CEO, if you're not the CEO, to sign a simple statement of support, um, which is to be submitted by the uh, webs website, which is www.webs.org. Um, there is also a huge number of learning resources that have been created by UN women and people like Stephanie Foster, who's joined us today, um, to basically help you take your or start your gender equality journey and, and implement the webs. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please do reach out to us um, directly at ctg at webs, webs at ctg.org and we'd be very happy to help you um, with your signing and we also would love to invite you to join we're hopefully going to be hosting some more webinars um, on how to implement the webs in conflict settings and um, we would love to invite you to join so uh, we will probably have those available on our social media you can also join look at the ctg website and sign up to our newsletter and then you will receive invitations to further webinars. So I'd like to say thank you very much to my panelists and I look forward to continuing the discussion.